I'm going to try to turn that on right now. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, uh, I think that um, if you have questions, it's fine to just um, unmute your microphone and go ahead and ask. The other option, uh, if you haven't used Zoom before, there's a, uh, if you mouse down to the bottom, you can click on chat and that opens up a chat window. So um, I'm going to be watching the chat window and uh, if, if anybody types something in there and Sanjay doesn't see it, I'll just uh, bring it to his attention. So those are two ways that uh, you can get, uh, that you can ask questions over the course of the session. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sanjay Mishra. He's the, um, going to be the uh, instructor for these lessons, and he's sharing his screen already. So I'm going to go ahead and mute my microphone and turn things over to him. So hello, um, everybody. I see uh, uh, a good number, 13. That's a pretty good number, given that we are into these very unusual circumstances. Um, I, in one sense, apologize this class when I had designed. So the first, the first thing I want to make it clear is that um, Python is a large world. It's a very encompassing world, and I do not claim to know a lot of it. Um, the reason to start this, the, the reason to do this class came out of my own struggles and explorations to make from uh, sort of a traditional non-computational uh, biological based uh, problem researcher to try to get a better handle of these emerging tools and python is definitely one of the best not the only one uh, there are uh, there are a lot of you it's possible that you either already know it or already use it um, r is a very uh, a useful tool the problem uh, with what i've had found in general either to teach myself or then to help others is that a lot of the teaching is designed from very bottoms up. And uh, that's a great approach. If you ever want to learn uh, it to do the right way, uh, you had to dig deeper and you have to understand all the nuances. Given that we have a limited amount of time, often this comes down to a frustration that do I want to spend a lot of time trying to learn things that I may or may not ever use or even if they are very useful, it is difficult to appreciate uh, in the beginning, why am I making made to do all of that? So instead of doing this, I have found that a better approach that works for me and the others who I have helped to is instead of going from the nitty gritties of the fundamentals, try to come up with a practical, directly tangible solution and then learn it and as you learn from that basic toolkit which you can figure it out somewhat easily even though it is not very really fulfilling and encompassing in the long term by doing it you begin to understand why you do what you do and once you know that uh, you can then because we all are pretty smart uh, individuals we can put two and two together and that uh, sometimes works better for at least some people so this approach is uh, what i would be using Unfortunately, this approach also demanded a couple of things. And one of them was this was supposed to be an interactive session, which means that I had intended that I would actually be able to walk to you and be able to see where you were struggling because oftentimes the bigger Python community is pretty oblivious to those problems. They do not appreciate why somebody can be uh, naive in not figuring out simple colon notation or dot notation or stuff like that. Now, uh, given that the circumstances that we are in, of course, that is practically out of place. I cannot walk to your uh, two screens and I actually can see what the problem is. Uh, the other thing is I cannot ask back and forth question because we have muted most of you, although you can always unmute yourself. So if you think the need and if you want to stop something, uh, feel free. Uh, Steve is monitoring uh, chat, so he will be able to uh, look at your question. Uh, you can momentarily unmute yourself if you have an audio uh, and feel free to ask a question if there would be and if we can catch it up at that time, we will, uh, I will try to uh, answer it right then and there. The other thing is, the expectation was also while is that you will have a functioning Anaconda notebook. But if you don't, I have a momentarily solution. This is a solution that works well, especially if you want to do small problems and um, you're not doing a very big data sets, you're not trying to look for things that have to be 
uh, functioning uh, for a long duration. So if you can see here on my window here, I have shown a Google search and on the Google search, you will see that there is this Microsoft Azure notebooks. These notebooks are pretty uh, useful. It's a free source that, that uh, Microsoft provides. So if you click on this, and in my case, it will be different, but if you click on it, um, you will see here that there is a sign in window. Um, because our Vanderbilt system is a Microsoft integrated system, so if you click on it here, uh, depending on where you are, you will be able to log into your account. Like in my case, it logs me straight away to my VUMC account. But if in your case, if you don't, uh, if you enter your Microsoft, uh, if you enter your VUNet or Vanderbilt IDs, or even if you have a Microsoft Home account of 365 or something, you should be able to go into this. And then once you are there, then you should be able to go to this project. This is a small window that I have created. So you should be able to go to this intermediate Python 20, 2020 and then I am going to send this link on the chat window. So you should be able to click on it, this and you should be able to um, be able to use this. So let's see, how do I um, chat? Where is the chat window here? Where would be a chat window for everybody? Steve, do you know where the chat is on this thing? Um, I think if you mouse down to the bottom, there is a button for chat. And uh, I think that opens a chat screen on the right. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if that works for you. There it is. Oh. So if you click on that link, uh, this should be able to. So the question here is, and I don't know how to get back the answer, does everybody has a functioning Anaconda at this point? How would we know? Can you, can everybody please uh, reply it on the chat window if the chat window is open for you all? Is there anybody? So maybe is there anybody who doesn't have an Anaconda on their local computer? Because then we are, okay. It looks like everybody has an Anaconda, okay. So then we don't need to worry about it. Uh, the only reason why I would worry because I had no other way to, uh, quickly push through the data files. So there are data files. So if you can click on that window, you should be able to get to the data. And there are a bunch of these files. We wouldn't need them immediately in the first couple, first half of the thing, but you should be able to just download these files as a right click. So if you right click it, uh, you should be able to uh, download it to some place on your local computer. Uh, we will be using these. So download should work. Um, so let's go to the uh, to the anaconda, and uh, we will start um, playing around with this. Uh, the first thing. So um, let's look at this first, very first cell, and we don't need this right now here. So I can delete it. The basic working with the Python, and I am talking here Python in the sense of a data science. So my primary goal on at least this first one and the second one, and maybe even going downward is that one of the most important things that we do often time is use Python to make uh, figures and graphs and to understand the data. So I am assuming that we all have a file of some kind of an experimental outcome, which has been generated by some instrumentation system. Either you have collected the data and probably you have been filling it on, uh, on an Excel sheet somewhere, or you have been uh, populating data based upon individual observation, I would start with that assumption. And at least for the class one and the class two or for the interaction one and interaction two, that would be the primary understanding. So before we go into it, um, those who know Python, they would, it would, they would find it pretty straightforward and easy. But those who may not be using it on the regular basis will find that if you have been comfortable using an Excel sheet, Excel oftentimes, is a very good tool and it understands on its own when you type something as an entry, what does entry mean? So here I'll give you an example. This is a very basic core uh, Python. The very first cell here is a very core basic functionality. I create a thing called my list and my list is now here under this square brackets and I have these bunch of four entries. I have a number one, as you can see sometimes the color changes. 
The other entry is A, and you would notice that this is under these two uh, quotation marks. And then I have a thing called true, and then I have a 0 0.6. If I hit this, and if I do, if, so if I do this, what it does is that it creates a thing called a list. List is a vector. So if any of you have a recollection about the matrices or the matrix elements, this is a vectoral matrix element. And it creates these four different kind of things and enters them into this thing called my list. Now, if I enter it, you see that it puts it back. It, is, it has now stored it under a thing called my list, which has four members. It has a number one, it has a character A, it has a thing called true, and I'll come to what does this true means. And then there is a thing called 0 0.6. Now, similarly, we can also create, so in this case, we have a list which has four heterogeneous elements. We can also have different lists which have each element of one kind. So the next one, if you see here, is there is a call A, which has all the elements of the character type. So we have A, B, C, and D. And then we have a uh, call B, which has all the things of the character type one, two, three, and four, sorry, uh, the integer type one, two, three, and four. Now, before we go to that, let's, if we enter this, now it generates these two different strings. And at that point, all of these, my list, call A and call B have been stored. Now, there are certain things, so I, I don't know how, have you ever come across this conundrum, whether to use a notebook or whether to do your Python programming on a shelf? One of the advantages of working with a notebook kind of a system is that you can do something in a little shell, you do it, and then you move on to the next one. It has its own drawbacks and it has its own advantages. So one of the advantage here is that now I can generate these cells by a shortcut. So one of the shortcuts that I use often time, and you should get familiar with if you already not, uh, one of the shortcuts that I use is that I use control enter. So if I do a control enter, that thing will just run this cell on its own. So if you haven't practiced it, if you have been always going to here and running the cell from the, that, that is a very slow process. Now, if you have to enter a new cell, let's hold escape and you do a B and that will create a new cell underneath that. Here, if you do print, if you do print call A, you will see that that thing has been printed and that's the entry of A, B, C's and D's. Now we can ask a question, what is this thing? And like I said, I already told you that this is a list. But we can find out if we are ever into doubt, the type command is a good command for you to use. So you use type call A, as you see in the cell below. And here, if you run it, it tells you that it is a list. Now, I assume that given that you have Anaconda, you all are Python users. So you do remember that the Python is a zero index methodology. Those who come from R, they find it confusing because in R, the index starts from one. So it's a one index system. What does that mean is that we can use these index elements to now find out what is that particular entry on a list is. So if we go to the call one, call A, and if I do these square brackets and I hit zero, you will see that it will return you the number, the, the, the character A, which is the first element on that list. But because it is a zero index, we actually have it as A. So that's the call A parenthesis square parenthesis zero returns you the A. We can similarly also use a large number of, so if we have a string, like in this case, it's only a four uh, member list. But let's say we want to do a, a certain range. So now we have this zero to two. What does that mean is that zero is the first one. You can actually escape it and you, can, you don't even need to put it there. But let's say you do it, you have zero colon two. What it will do it, that it will start from the beginning element. So it will start from the zero, and, but it will stop at the second element, or in this case, it will be the third element. It stops at third element, which means it prints until two. So if we do that, we get this elements one and two, which you will remember. Uh, and now you can create a cell above. So remember I told you that the control B inserts a cell below, a control A will insert it above that. And here, if you had printed call A, 
or call B, you will see that it is, it is a one, two, three, four element. So from here, you can match that the first element, which is here zero, is the first one, and then the second and third and fourth. So the first and second, it stops at one and two. Similarly, we can go back. Remember, we started with a heterogeneous element. So we have a my list, so I print that. Now, if you look at the very first element of the my list, which is the first element, zero index is zero, that is one. This is the first kind of Python um, data type. And that data type we can find out by calling type my list in zero. So if we do that, as you see, it returns as an integer, which is obvious. And integers are the regular numbers which do not have decimals into them. Um, if you would have looked up the last element of this uh, my list 0 0.6, if I were to go to that, which is on here, if you enter it, that's a float. So you have a decimal number, which is a float, and you have the regular numbers, which are int. Floats are something we come across pretty regularly. Um, most of the data sets do carry float. When you are handling floats, be careful because floats are not exactly the same as int. So if you had a 0.33 and you multiplied by three, it would not reflect you one, although one by three in our normal numeric system gives you a 0.33 because floats don't approximate back to zero. And they also tend to be computationally a little more intensive. Going to the second element, so we had this, that element, if you remember here, was a, a character A, and this is what it returns as a string A. Um, the third element, which I had called you true, that one is a Boolean character. And I will come to these values if you haven't already, if you aren't really familiar with them, they have some very beautiful properties which we use to parse, slice, and dice the data. And they also gives, give you a value to find out exactly what you need from a large data set. Now, let's say we have a list. And the reason why I'm dwelling so much on the list is for a lot of the people, the primary data entry starts with a collection of the data where in a small world, you might have a data set that you would have generated from 10 observations. And oftentimes, those 10 observations will be listed into a vector. So uh, it is possible that this might be overkill for some of you, but for the benefit of those who may not be using it on a frequent basis, this becomes a good starting point. Although this seems very simple, there's a lot of important pitfalls into that, which if you're not familiar with, and if you're not using it regularly, you might not understand what goes on when you were dealing with a bigger uh, data set. So let's, let's quickly look it into, you have a vector, uh, maybe you forgot how long that vector is, you don't know how many elements there are, uh, so you go and you measure the length of it, and that's, as you remember, in my list, we had only four elements. It returns you the length of that, which is the four elements in that list. Now you have a data set. You had a list. Um, you need to add new data to that because you collected new observation. How are you going to add it? There are three methods to that. Um, you can use an append, which is the easiest, and what that does is that by default, append will add a new element at the end of the list. Then you have insert. Insert is a more sophisticated way of doing it, but it is also a little complicated. What you need to know is where exactly in that list you want to append that element. So let's say you have a four membered link and your new data belongs at the second place, not at the end. So then you will use the insert. And so you will tell where to go and you will tell what to add. Extend is very similar to append, but the difference is that append will make you add one element at a time, whereas extend will take an existing list and will give you and add a sequence of elements, and then they will add all one by one at the end. So we can quickly look at the example. So we had uh, my list. I append into that a new element called new. So when I do that, this now becomes my new list. I had already had the one, I had a character A, I had a Boolean true, and I had a float 0 0.6. And now A I added at the end, a new. Now let's say that at the very first place, the very first entry, I wanted to add another new. I would not be able to do that with the append. So I will need to use this insert structure. And I will tell that on the insert at this first position, which is the zeroth index, I want to add new. So I did that, 
and I get now a new one, a true 0 0.6 and new. Similarly, if I had to add it this one and two, I will have the sequence, but pay attention here, if you don't not familiar with it, this is now a tuple. And what that is that now we have to put this into a parenthesis. So the first hype, the parenthesis that you had, that was signature for the method extent. The second one here is taking that entire string, the one, two, and however many you have, and you put that inside that method. And when you do that, now you get this new one, eight, two, zero point six new, and now you have one and two. Now, as it happens, not that it is a good thing to do, but we always collect a data set. We have a vector, we have a list, but some of those elements are not needed. So as important it is to be able to edit and add new elements to the list, it is also very important for us how we delete them. Python is always elegant in the sense that there is never a one method to do anything. So in this case, again, we have at least two good methods. Uh, there are definitely more methods depending on how big or how complicated your data set is. Is it a single uh, step or is it multi-step, but I will stick with the simplest and the simplest is the pop method. And elegantly, what does that mean? The pop method will remove an element if you tell which element you have to remove it to. So let's say that we had the very first element. Remember we added the new at the very first position in the element. Now there are two news. We don't want both of them. We need only one. So what we do, we use the method pop and give it what index to remove, which is my list.pop0. And when we do that, now we have a list which comes back with one a true 0 0.6 new one and two. Had you not given that, let's say that you would have not given that value, the index value, the default position for the index is the last position. So if you did not give it, if you did just my list.pop, no entry, then it would have removed the last one. Now, sometime we don't remember it, depending on how big your list is, remembering what is the position, what is the index can get complicated. So it would be much better off if you could remove it by a method where we know what we want to remove, but we don't know where it is. This is easier if you're working with a string, it is difficult if you're working with the numbers, but for the string or the characters, it's pretty easy because you then put that thing where it is. Like in this case, we want to remove the remaining new. So we give my list start remove new and we do that and that will remove the new. Now, what happens if there was no new? So now you see that there is nothing here. If there is no new, obviously there is nothing to match and the Python will yell back at you that there is none in the element. So that's advantage and that's the disadvantage. The advantage is that you don't need to remember, you don't need to count and you don't have to look at what element are you trying to remove. The disadvantage is it looks for a literal match and if that match doesn't exist, then this would not be a useful way to do it. So we can also then go to a method which is slightly more elegant because it doesn't require you to remove elements one by one. And this is a method that is the part of the core Python library called del, and it comes handy for a lot of deletion and it very obvious, for obvious reasons, it is called del because it deletes. And what that does is that if you have the list and you wanted to remove multiple values, you give the index using the colon notation that I told you before, and then you just tell that and that will remove it. Before I go from here, I really want to, and I think I should have asked this before, uh, can everybody be able to put me on a chat? Where do you think that, are, are you, how many of you are regular users of Python and how many of you are novice and how many of you have used it sometime but you don't really remember at all anymore? Because that is important. I should have asked that early on because I don't want to be boring you with the newer, minor details and while glossing over more important things. Okay, so Selma uses it uh, sometimes. Um, Sarah had used it before, but she's not regularly it. Uh, 
somebody, okay, so somebody here is a regular user and then a case no, sometimes. So, okay, so the next question then, is this indexing notation obvious to you? Do you understand how the indexing works? Because we will be using the indexing more frequently going forward than say right now. Okay, good. So then I don't need to dwell too much on this. And the reason I brought it up is because if you notice here, this is one, one other way to index. One is the index that you start from the beginning. First element is zero, and then you go on to further. You can also skip the element. So if you have say zero colon colon two, it will take beginning from the zero, will take every second element and go forward. Let's say you had to go backward you can go backward by minus notation. So your minus will then begin from the back side. So in this case, if I would have used say my, my list minus two, this gives you one and two, and we want to remove those two elements. So I then use the del method and I go del my list and then use that same thing and then I hit it. So now if you see what we have left with the, what we started in the beginning, we have one, the character A true and 0 0.6. So hey, San, Sanjay, yes. can I ask a question? Yes. So when you say uh, del my list minus two colon, uh -huh. you're indicating to start two from the end, and then the fact that there's nothing after the colon, which means go it goes on to the, to the end. The end. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, usually, whenever we leave anything empty, uh, so if we started, let's say that we had to go from beginning to four, we will not need by default if we leave that empty so let's say that we did my list i will actually give you an example here so let's say that we did um my list and we just filled it nothing until three the zero is implicit so it will automatically take from zero one and two it stops at third similarly when we leave after the colon the zero is implicit which means it goes till the last element in that sequence now, um, so we, one of the important thing about Python, and again, this is something that uh, it comes, it's like a complicated choice. Um, oftentimes, the certain things that we use, even at the most core level, do require some understanding of some, something more complicated. And functions are one of those things. Functions make what programming languages are so beautiful, because you can do a lot of things. And I was told at once that, if you have to do anything more than three times, you should have written a function to do it because you shouldn't be copy pasting any code or anything that you send it to some place. You should write a function, give it to the function so the computer does it for you so you don't do an error because copy paste first time is bad enough, second time is terrible, and third time you shouldn't be doing it. Which means you should be comfortable writing functions. And it's easier said than done because Oftentimes, it's a complicated process, but let's let's start with this a very basic function and I will give you a very simple example of a function. This is a very simple function. I give it a definition. So I call it def. I give it a name and I can give it whatever name I want. So long as that name doesn't conflict with something that is already existing in the Python core competency. So we give it def my function and I tell it what the input is. And this is about as simple a function can go. I'm giving it one input. This is not a good function because it doesn't tell whether that input is supposed to be string type, float type, bool type, or whatever. But let's stick with that. So we give it my function. I call it my fun, ask for it to give x, and then I give a definition what this function is supposed to do. Because one of the most important thing we all have to remember when you're writing a code, you have to be very clear what the code is supposed to do. This is not only for the benefit of others who might have to read your code and may not understand what the heck that this thing is doing. It is also important for you to remind yourself in a day from now, why did you write the function? And if you're writing, if you're writing anything, if you're writing a regular code, not only the reproducibility is an important thing, the context under which you thought because it's a thinking process. So you're supposed to give a small description of what that thing does. So here is, this is how you do it. When you hit enter, so if you write a function, basic function, let's say that you do 
def my func and we give it x you do a colon it doesn't matter what you write it and you do this here if you do these small three time it automatically fills it you tell what this function do this function squares a number so you next time when you come across you know what that is and when if you hit it there this thing will be uh, into one tab apart and that tab is critical because that tells that that is the part of the function routine so here we return we call it return because this is this is all it is going to do it's going to take that number x and it will return it back so this is our basic function and we can test this function by simply giving this value and we can test this function by giving an input value four so we got this uh, of course and here it returns as expected it returns you 16. now sometime and you will come across this and then there, again please bear with me why am i dwelling on it because this is again i struggle with it a lot in the beginning so we have this function now we can save this function and one of the ways that you can do it is that you can have similar functions written it down so i'll quickly open a function um, and i'll explain you i don't want to uh, live code because that always is pit, full of pitfalls as you notice that i did uh, um, a typing error so here is a function i wrote it down a similar function this function now has multiple steps it has a my square that's the first part of the function or oh, this is a script actually it's not one function it is a script which has multiple functions i have one script here one function here which is the my square which just squares the number like the way i showed before then the next one is which cubes it so i have another function my cube and it returns this thing i can then save it as a i can download it as a python file now remember this is a notebook notebook is a step above a regular python vanilla string script I save it as a function file. I save it as a Python and I download it right where I have. And so here is my file and I've already saved it with my func. And I just save it as my func, right? Wants to ask me, replace it. And we can look at it into how it looks like. And this would be a good demonstration how a notepad or a, or, or a, um, or a notebook is somewhat different from a regular function. So here is this. And now you can see it here. There is a config here. And then this is the cell where it was entered most of this is useless so we can remove it it's not as important and we save it back where it was now once we have a function like this if we go back we can actually import this function because we have written it down so what we're going to do is that now we are going to import that library and let me keep it open so if you need we need to we can see it this is how it looks Hmm. Yeah, here it is. So if you notice in that script, I have two functions. I have a my square or my sq, and then I have a my cube. What I'm going to do is that now I am going to import that script that I wrote. So long as it is in my environment, I call from my func, I import my sq. So remember, the script itself is called my func, and on that I have a my sq and I have my cube. If I import this, now I don't have to rewrite this whole thing all over again. So now if I do it, all I have to do is that once I have done it, if I do the my sq3, it will return me the value 9. Which means that if I have a good enough script written down somewhere within the environment, now if you want it to be persistent all the time, then you will have to have that in your path, which means you will be able to, you should be able to change the path of your computational path of your Python uh, environment. But if you don't, you can always copy that script, keep it in the same folder where you're working, and then you can reproducibly use those exact same thing. It is also important because what we are going to do next is we are going to use what is called the Python libraries. Libraries are big scripts which have been created by people who then deposit it into the Python environment. So when you install them, 
you get these libraries. There are lots and lots of libraries, as you all know, they can do a lot of elegant things. So what you do, you rely on those libraries, you install them, and by doing so, they are now available for you to use later. What it means is that now you're gonna utilize those by exact same from structure. So we will be using somewhere down the line, a thing called matplotlib. And matplotlib has a big structure into which there is a pie plot section. So we will write from matplotlib dot pie plot import so and so. What it means is that in that large script, you don't want to import everything. You're importing exactly what you need, but you are importing it. And oftentimes we also do something else. We give it an alias because the name, my matplotlib.pyplot is a giant name. And everyone who does computer does at least one thing good to be lazy. So if you're lazy, you really don't want to type that thing all and all and every time. So what we will instead do, we will import that kind of a library. So here we are going to this. We are importing this library called pandas, which is a very powerful library and we will be using this a lot going forward. So we import pandas and we give it a new alias. We just call it pd. That saves us some of the typing. So we import pandas as pd and now it is available for us to do. The regular thing. One of the most important thing is that, and again, if you are not familiar with it, I suppose most of you are, but if you are not, if you do pd dot and then you hit your tab, you will see it opens a large number of down of, of, of available options and methods. So you don't have to mistype it. Sometime by just looking at it, you will remember what to do and you will know exactly how it should be syntactically because if anything else, Python and every computing languages can be really annoying when you have a wrong syntax. You don't know exactly what to type. So let's say that we had to read something. We do read, and as you notice, as I am doing it, it is also changing what is associated syntaxes. So we do this, and now we get to the read multiple kind of file. So depending on what kind of file you have, you have a CSV, Excel, uh, text files, those are the more common ones. But depending on your uses, you might also be using JSONs have become very powerful these days. And then you have a whole lot of files. So we will be using them. But Tab notations are very useful because as you do dot and then you do tab, you know how to pre-fill that thing on its own. And now if you have to delete this cell, you hold escape D, D twice and that deletes the cell. So let's now, um, before we go on to a large full scale data frame and data frame is basically, remember we talked about the list. List is a single dimensional vector. What a data frame is, it has two things into it, and it's a unique invention, so to speak, for the modern Python implementation is, it has two things. It has multiple lists, all up to equal size, and it also has an extra thing called index, and that index is built in into the pandas data frame. There are Python data frames, the core Python data frames where you probably don't need them. You can have a NumPy array, which is each in an array, and you don't need an index, you just know which one is it. But Python data frame with index make it very easy to handle a lot of the data set by locating where they are. And then if you have something like a date time object as an index, it becomes very useful to use that index also to do other elegant things. So we will come to that later. But let's say a very simple data frame. So the one of the simple data frame you can make is, remember we had the call A and that was just a list. If you don't remember it, we can see what it is. It's just a list of four letters. So we have A, B, C's, and D's. Now, if you take that and you apply it to the pandas data frame method, so it is pd dot data frame, and then you give it call A and D of one, this will return you a data frame. So I think at this point, given that we are about 1148, I would like, okay, let me ask this question. Has everything until this point been more than clear to everybody? Is there anyone who is not quite following my chain of thoughts? Rest of it? Okay. Do we need to practice making a data frame? Salma, do you want to, do you, do you have your Anaconda library open? Do you have an Anaconda? Can you, can you open a new notebook and actually 
do me three things create a list four element list maybe try and if you want to uh, i can go back to the list and I, I just want you to all to be very clear because sometimes the whole thing rests on these basic elements so can everybody just make quickly these uh two lists call a with one two three four or a b c d's and call b with one two three four and please let me know that it worked Is everybody good? Maybe we can try unmuting everybody and see what, whether we can handle the feedback. Steve? I think now everybody is unmuted. So uh, we will see if there is a background noise, probably we'll have to unmute, but I think being able to listen is a good feedback. Um, chat is good, but it's not perfect. Okay, so is everybody good with their uh, list? I see David, yeah, I see you have made a list A and B and that's that's good. Is everybody good with that? It's fine. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, now, so now let's go back and try to make a simple data frame. This is a very simple basic data frame with only one column, of course, very useless, but still uh, good enough to try. So let's try this a data frame. All we have to do is call for and make sure that you have loaded the pandas library, which should not be difficult. It is just this um, from import pandas as PD. And once you have that, uh, just give it a pandas data frame and let's have this first simple one vector data frame. Everybody good? Yes. Okay. Now, if you notice, because we didn't give it any column name, the pandas created a name, and that name is basically just the index of the column zero. If you had more than one, it would have automatically filled them by zero, one, two, and three. Oftentimes, we don't want that. Uh, I mean, that may not that may be functional for certain situation. It may not be useful in all situation. So what we had to do it is that instead of giving it as PD dot data frame call A, which was the list, we'll also utilize the columns and then we will give it a name. Watch though, here you need to provide the columns as a list. So anytime when we create a Python element with these square brackets with multiple entries, it's a list. When we have just those parenthesis values, those are tuple and we will come back probably uh, somewhere down either in this class or somewhere down the line, the difference between a tuple and a list. But what you need to do, you have to be provide. So of course, this is a single column data frame. So you will provide only one column, choose mm -hmm. your name, whatever you want. But this is where we have. So we have the next entry, which is a data frame. We provided the list and we gave it a name column. And now we have a column, uh, a data frame, which is more common looking. So make sure you know that. Uh, once you've done it, we will come to the next section and we'll try to begin dissecting these for useful values. Are we good? Did it work for everybody? Yep. Okay. So now, remember we, in the beginning we, and the type function here is maybe not that important now, but it does, it, it seems like always a good thing for me to test whenever I get into the trouble. Oddly, 
the type and D type comes very handy because one of the bad thing that happens with any uh, programming environment other than the commercially made environment is that they are really bad at guessing good things. And I know R does a better job than Python. Um, in R, there is a better understanding when you're importing a data frame, it tries to guess pretty well what kind of your, uh, your entries are in the certain column is. Python is not that good at it. So whenever you run into trouble, always go back to D types and types and you will find that your problems can often be resolved if you pay attention to what the type and D type is. So yeah, anyway, here we have the DF. Remember we just created the data frame. If you would have seen before when we had used the type my call, that was a list and that is what it returned. Actually, it was called A for me. Here it gives you a list, whereas the DF1, this is when we enter, this is a data frame. And forget about the rest of the data, detail what the Panda's core is. But what it is, is it's a data frame. Similarly, we can also look at what the D types, and that's the difference between inside that. And so if you look at, it tells you what are the types of that thing is in this column. So since it is a single column data frame, this will tell you, if you had used ABCDs, then it will tell you that this is a column with an object. Had you had one, two, three, four, it will tell you that is an int, and we will come back to that. Similarly, remember I told you that the pandas data frame has also another thing built in into what's called index. So that index then is, you can extract that index similarly from here, and you can go to it, and you can see that these indices here are zero, one, two, and three. In this case, these indices were filled on its own, but you can provide those indexes from outside. So you can have a data frame where you provide the column, you give it what index you want to use, and then also tell what the column names are. So here we now have creating another data frame, we give it a list, and then we gave it, and that is different from the previous one where we had a DF1, which was auto-filled, where it was zero, one, two, three, and here it is one, two, three, four, and we have filled it from outside. And the reason I was going to do it is because I wanted to show you further down how these, how to slice and dice the data frame based upon the index values. And unfortunately the default zero, one, two, three, four was gonna be a little confusing because no matter which method I use, they would have laid to the same thing. But I look at here that it's now 1157. So given that it is a class, I think we'll have to probably stop at somewhere this point uh, I apologize, the progress was a little slow because of this uh, odd weight uh, on how this thing is. But uh, is there somebody has, is somebody has a question at this point on this? No, I think some people are muted here. Okay, so the question here is how large do you normally let your main Jupyter notebook script get before you start splitting into several files in order to import them? Um, it is always a good idea to have a script which you intend to reuse for something more than that particular notebook to be out of your main system. Now, if you're doing, a, say, a visualization, and that visualization requires you to make four graphs out of say one or two or three graphs, uh, two data sets. It's perfectly all right to have them all in one. So when you call them, you don't have to, because one of the risks of keeping them into multiple places is that your data comes from different places and then you might end up uh, not knowing where they are. One of the things that I do, and I know a lot of other people do, is that if they are cleaning up the data, they would like to keep the clean data in a separate notebook and from there they might create a new data frame which is now only the useful data frame they will take that data frame call for that in a different notebook and create their graphs and then if they have a third one where they're probably going to utilize say a machine model or some kind of prediction routine they might prefer to do it on the third it sometimes comes down to your own personal choice i would not like to have a notebook which runs into 50, 60, 70 uh, scrolls down because you begin to then lose track 
And one of the biggest risks about the notebooks is that you might have done something midway, which might have changed the variable name somewhere halfway through. And while it would run at that moment, once you close it and restart it, now it, you don't know exactly where did you change the name for what. So one of the risks about a very long notebook is that you may not be able to track the variable names and all that. But I doubt if there is any hard and fast rule. It, is, it comes down to your own understanding about cleanliness and coherence. Um, if you are writing a whole book, you can keep the, everything into um, one chapter into one notebook and that would be perfectly fine. Hello? 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 Was there a question somewhere? That may have just been noise. Okay. Um, so I was just going to say, we, so we're at 12 o'clock and um, I, I just wanted to make a final comment and then we can stay online if people have other questions they want to ask. Um, what I've done, if you go to the, um, the schedule page, the vanderbiss.lt slash pi page, in the notes section with this lesson, I've put a link to the Azure Notebook. Also, um, the two different ways you can run it, you can either clone the notebook if you wanna run it as your own Azure Notebook, you can click on the download project link if you wanna open it in a Jupyter Notebook. Um, also, I put a link in there to the, um, the lesson that we had in the beginner lessons of modules and packages if anybody wants to look at that. And what I'll do when, uh, after we finish the recording, I will also put a link to the recording in that same place so that if anyone uh, wants to go back and rewatch any part of the lesson, you'll be able to do that. Um, okay, chat says we upload yes. this particular I will. Um, I will upload whatever we have so far onto that uh, Jupyter notebook that I was taking. And uh, I will see if I can upload into GitHub either this time or maybe next time when the whole thing is into one coherence. But yes, these notes, these one would be available on the Jupyter, uh, the, the Azure that I was, uh, Azure notebook that I was talking about. I will update it and then you can clone it on your own end and be able to uh, run it on your local environment. And so just the place where we'll put all the links to these kinds of things are in the notes section on the schedule. So just uh, look there. Uh, and as the materials become available, we'll put them there. Sure. So as I said, if anybody has to leave because it's noon, go ahead. But otherwise, uh, we can uh, continue to ask questions. Yeah, I'm still around. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I'm up here for next half an hour. Or so if, you, uh, if anybody has a question, uh, I wouldn't necessarily progress on it. But if there is something that needs uh, clearing on this point, uh, I'm most wel you're most welcome to stay. If somebody has a question. Okay, it looks like uh, everybody is good, so. Okay, all right, yeah. well, thanks everybody for coming and we'll see you again, same time next week. Okay, thank you. Steve, are you good? Do we need me for something? No, I think we're good. I'm going to try to stop.